Thank you. Well, no, no, Sir will there? be joining from Memodul's uh, system. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We're doing the... Okay, we are going live in five seconds. Five seconds. So, sorry. <laughs> We can start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Green Card with Gehi. Um, today, we have on the panel myself, Soraya Rahman. I am an immigration attorney uh, with Gehi and Associates. Um, I've been with the company on and off for approximately 10 years now. Um, we also have on the panel uh, attorney Gregory Ippolito. Um, he is an immigration attorney also. He um, has a lot of experience in representing clients in removal defense, um, along with uh, affirmative asylum interviews with USCIS. And uh, we will also have uh, joining later uh, Naresh Gehi um, to um, share with us his uh, expertise and experience with asylum. That that's today's topic. It's um, um, the you know what is required for asylum. Uh, you know our experiences with asylum. So we'll be talking about that today. Um, the whoever, viewers, you're welcome to ask questions, and we'd be happy to. Um, answer them for you, try our best to answer them for you. And of course, you, everyone, uh, the viewers, you, you're you welcome to contact our firm to um, schedule an individualized consultation with myself or uh, Mr. Ippolito or Naresh Gehi. Um, you can reach us at the numbers that are uh, on our background. We have three offices. We have one on in Jackson Heights. We have an office in Jamaica. Queens, and we have an office in Ozone, Ozone Park also in Queens, and the numbers are right there on the side. Um, so we can go ahead and start talking about uh, what is asylum. We can start there with the basics. Um, Greg, you want to you wanna tell us a little bit about what asylum is? What is, what is asylum? Sure. So asylum, the basic, the basic element of asylum is you fear returning to your country of origin. For some reason, you're not allowed, you cannot go back. And if you go back, you will be persecuted. So if you come to the United States through whatever means and you're, you fear going back, you can file an asylum claim. One of the main issues is that you need a basis for asylum and a nexus. Now, what this is, is that you have to be part of a protected group and the reason for your persecution has to be because you're part of that group, whether it's based on race, religion, gender, sexuality. Uh, those are that's the basis. OK, yeah, that's that's about right. And of course, there's other elements to um, receiving that protection from from the U.S. government. Now, you said it has to be connected to a specific um, nexus. Uh, that sounds like a very fancy word. What, what is what does that mean? What does nexus mean? So that means the persecution that you suffered in the past, or that you fear suffering in the future if you were to return, has to be because of your membership in a group. If you're, say, you're religious, say you're Christian, in a, and your persecution is because you're Christian, right? If you were attacked because someone's just trying to rob you, there's a nexus. There has to be the persecution you suffered, whether it was physical, economical, um, or threats, has to be connected to your membership in that group. Right. And, and when you say membership in a group, what what exactly do you mean by that? Um, you know, there is that uh, group uh, that's written into the statute uh, specifically called particular social group. Is that, um, how is that defined in, in your experience? How have you seen that being defined? So, so that is defined as, as a, um, it has to be an identifiable or cogniz cognizable um, way of identifying them. 
Okay, um, some issues, some social groups that worked were women who were unable to leave their marriages in matter of arc G, right? Another, the case law is matter of arc G. A social group that didn't work was informants for the police, a uh, matter of CA, okay? Whereas women unable to leave their marriages could not, there was no safe part of a country for them to go to because they were identifiable as married and they were unable to leave their abusive relationships. Whereas an informant could travel across the country and could not be easily, easily identifiable as a member at a woman in their group. Right. So let's let's step back a little bit. We we've talked um, very briefly about the substance. What is required for asylum claim? Let's step back a little bit and um, talk about the process. What is the process for asylum? So um, maybe our viewers already know there's two uh, distinct processes um, for making an application for asylum. You have what's called an affirmative application and you have um, a defensive application. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the affirmative process um, as I was a former asylum officer with USCIS. So I am familiar with the process. That does not mean that um, if you were to hire us or retain me to help you with your case, that doesn't mean that it, it would give you any advantages to filing your claim other than being able to provide my experiences um, while I was with USCIS. So, um, so the process, uh, affirmative process is for those who are not in removal or deportation proceedings. It's typically for people who have come on a, um, come on a visa, um, they've come through a port of entry through on a plane um, and they've come to the United States um, and they either already know or they've realized that they can't go back to their home country because they um, they're afraid they, they they will suffer harm because of you know certain reasons. So so the process there um, with affirmative process is that you file your application with USCIS. There's a form that's associated with that process. You file that form. Um, once you file the form, then you um, then USCIS will send you a, what's called a receipt notice to confirm that they received your application. Um, then you will have to go in and um, provide your fingerprints and your photo um, and, and other biometric information. <clears throat> um, after that, you get called in for an interview at the at your local at the closest asylum office to you to your residence. And an asylum officer will interview you and ask you the reasons um, why you're afraid to go back. The asylum officer will then reach a decision whether they um, believe that you uh, are entitled to the re relief of asylum or if they think that um, something is missing, an element which is required for the claim is missing, then they might do one of two things. If you're in status, they will deny your application. If you are out of status, they will refer your case to the immigration court. And once it's referred to the immigration court, you will have a second bite at the apple and you'll be able to present your claim before an immigration judge. Um, uh, and so the person who applies for asylum, <clears throat> they can include um, their spouse and any children under 20, unmarried children under 21 as part of their applications. Those family members that are in the United States. Um, and one, one, it, sometimes the process takes many years and to alleviate that process, USCIS, the law um, allows the applicants to apply for um, their work permit after 100 
um, to receive their work permit after 100 and after their application has been pending for 180 days so that they're not left uh, in this country while they're waiting for their interview, they can, you know, um, seek employment so that they can um, take care of themselves and not become a burden to the US government. So that is in a nutshell, that's the affirmative process. So um, I mentioned earlier that if if your claim is not accepted, it goes to the immigration court. So now um, I'll hand it over to uh, Mr. Ippolito who can tell us a little bit more about how the process works when you're in removal proceedings. Yeah, yes, so when you're in removal proceedings, it's immigration court. So you'll either be, as Raya discussed, you'll either be referred there from USCIS or you'll be sent there right away if, say, if you cross unlawfully without a visa. You'll first have a master hearing, a preliminary hearing. You'll submit the form, 589, with uh, an affidavit and evidence. You'll later be given a trial date and you'll have a hearing and we'll discuss all your evidence. Uh, there'll be a prosecutor, a defense attorney, and a judge, and we'll discuss your case. Now, while it's technically a trial, in practice, it's more like an extended de um, deposition where your attorney will ask you a series of questions referred to as a direct examination. We'll start with a biography. We'll discuss your past persecution and your well-founded fear of future persecution. Then the prosecutor, um, otherwise known as a assistant chief counsel in immigration speak, will um, then do a cross-examination. Afterwards, the judge will usually get involved and um, at question you on things that concern the judge and the court in general. Um, from there, you're given a decision. Sometimes they give it to you right there. Sometimes they make you wait several months, um, but that's pretty much the process. We, in, well, in, well in advance of a hearing or the trial, we submit all your evidence, we'll draft a brief, we'll, um, and prepare you for this. So by the time the trial happens, everything's squared away um, and you're ready to go. And so, Mr. Ippolito, so when um, a person is in removal proceedings and they have a pending claim for asylum, are they still entitled to apply for or renew a work permit in that setting? Uh, yes, Soraya. Um, the work permits, or EADs, as they call them, are um, granted for usually one to two years, and if you're in removal proceedings, you are allowed to reapply once yours expires. Okay, yeah, and that's a, um, I would say that's a very critical benefit, which, um, you know, is very, you know, in, a, in our practice, we've seen um, our clients um, really need that worker authorization just because yes. the process takes so long. Um, in, in most cases, it takes so long. Um, yeah, so sometimes we have these cases, they're over in several months. Others, I mean, we've had some at our firm that last 10 years. Yeah. And depending on the complexity of the case, the issues involved, um, the courts um, being overwhelmed, it's hard to control. So you'll have your work permit for the whole entire time until you're trying. And so... <laughs> Um, so I, I just, I, I think we, I may have overheard um, some additional panelists. Is anyone else joining? No, okay. okay. Um, so, we think, so, mm -hmm. so, I, so Soraya, as an asylum officer, um, is there anything that you would, during an interview, that would kind of set you off and, and either say, oh, this person, I, they, they deserve a grant, or Oh, or red flags that would cause you not to grant their asylum. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, of course, I don't speak for the government. Um, I, I'm just speaking as to uh, my, ex my experiences there. 
um, what, what, you know, it's very methodical. The interview is very methodical. Um, it's non-confrontational that's written into the practice um, practice manual for the asylum office is that the officer cannot be confrontational with the applicant. So, um, uh, you know, it, it's a very, you know, I would say almost friendly environment. The asylum officer is trying to work with the applicant to make sure all claims are explored um, and that they're, you know, thoroughly um, analyzed. Um, so I would not say there's any red flags. Every applicant is given, you know, their opportunity to present their claim. Um, but what I find very critical, um, even, even today as a practicing, you know, on the other side, representing um, applicants is credibility. Um, I find that's, the, you know, a very... Um, critical factor in somebody's claim and what is credibility? Credibility is the ability to present a detailed and consistent um, testimony of what happened to you or why why it is that you're afraid to go back to your country. So that means being able to explain, um, you know, if you were harmed, um, if you were hurt, if you're physically harmed to be able to explain in detail what happened to you, or if you claim to be a part of a specific group of people in your home country as a member of the BNP in Bangladesh, uh, if you identify as LGBTQ in um, Jamaica, um, being able to identify, to testify in detail how you fit um, into that category or what happened to you. And this is difficult because um, in, I would say 100% of the times, um, there are very traumatic experiences that our client um, or the applicant has gone through. So it's typical in these situations where uh, the applicant, it's very difficult for them to recall details. It's difficult for them to, um, to explain what happened in a continuous timeline because of the trauma associated with what happened to them. So um, this is, you know, where having uh, an experienced attorney is, uh, you know, might be very beneficial to the applicant because um, they will, you know, guide you through the testimony and how to help yourself um, during that time. Um, so that you can, you know, um, testify credibly and uh, with with the detail that's required um, by the asylum office or, you know, even before the immigration judge. Um, yeah. yeah. Con, I mean, credibility is usually, in court at least, it's one of the most crucial issues um, that judges look, that they look out for, um, you know, if you say when your case is with USCIS and you submit an affidavit and you leave out something of significance and then you later bring it up in court, they'll say, well, why didn't you bring it up the first time? How do we know it's true? If this is not significant, why didn't you bring it up the first time? And most of our clients, they've been through hell and back and they send out this application and they miss things. And so that it is crucial to get an attorney um, so we can make sure everything is done properly and you don't have problems later on. Right. And, and also that, you know, um, that brings up a good point too, which is that there's a requirement that you file your application within one year of your entry to the United States. Um, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the trauma is still very fresh in, you know, in our clients' minds um, when they're trying to file the application within one year um, after having to travel through multiple countries. And if they're crossing the border, that that process is traumatic in itself, of course. So um, yeah, um, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. Yeah, we all need someone to lean on. You can lean on your attorney, okay? Yeah. 
have us um, guide you through it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, I, I, we see a lot of applications that people do themselves. And then by the time they get to us, you know, like um, Sarai and I were discussing um, membership in a particular social group or basis for asylum. They'll say, originally, they'll, they'll say, oh, this was religious, but it's really political. And then that has to be explained later. You know, why was, why was this marked incorrectly? Why weren't these issues brought up? Um, so we, we help you get the truth out, okay? Right. And great. You've recently had some wins uh, before the immigration court. Do you want to talk about one of uh, one of your recent wins that you've had? Yeah, yes. So I could talk about for, for me in immigration court, the best cases are the ones that are the most simple, that are clearly either religious, um, sexuality or, uh, you know, political. I was part of this political party, the political party lost. They threatened my family, they attacked me. They have my number if I go back, right? Um, one of the recent ones was incredibly difficult. Um, I can't get, you know, due to confidentiality, I can't get into detail, but it was very difficult to connect his persecution, which he had a lot of evidence for. He had medical records. Um, after, you know, corroborating evidence, but it wasn't clear that they persecuted him because he was in this political party. And, uh, you know, I will say, um, I can't, like, I can't say too much, but he originally filed the, that our client originally filed the asylum application himself and didn't do a good job of explaining it, why he was attacked. Um, but he did say he was attacked. He, he was threatened. He would be killed if he went back, but he couldn't really articulate that it was because of the basis in a political group. He worked for a company and they came to his business and the way the government saw it was that he, they, this was an extortion racket and that it wasn't related to his politics. So by getting an attorney, we were able to clarify these issues to the court, save his credibility, and win the case. Did I get did I give too much away, Soraya? No, no. Um, we have to there, be careful when we, uh, of course, we all all of our clients' information is confidential, definitely. Um, so yeah, and, and that's you know, you've won many cases recently. That's just one of them, but yes, um we we could we could talk for hours about all yes. the cases that um we've recently won. So yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. we do have, mm -hmm. we do have a question, um, from a viewer. So, um, I'm just waiting for the moderator to share it with us. What kind of security checks do I have to undergo if I want to apply for asylum? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you'll do is once you apply for asylum, you'll have what's called a biometrics request. And you'll go to an um, immigration office and they'll fingerprint you, take your photograph and other, you know, your height, weight, and other information. And they do the background check on their own. If you've been living here for a while, they might, they may ask you to get police clearances and, um, you know, further evidence. Depend, if, if you do have a criminal record, it's another reason why we highly, you know, strongly recommend you get an attorney because some crimes may disqualify you from asylum and some may not. Um, so it's, if you do have a criminal record and you would like to file for asylum, it's even more crucial that you get an attorney. Right. Uh, what, what will prevent a person from getting asylum is if they are convicted of a particular serious crime, which could include an aggravated felony. Um, that um, in itself doesn't mean that you should not even try to get protection from the U.S. government. Um, no, we, we there are there are other options for you other than when you file when you file for asylum you file for 
asylum, you also file for what's called withholding of removal and also relief under the Convention Against Torture. Now, right. no matter, and Sarai and I can discuss this, we've had cases where if, if, um, people would, would have really suffered, I mean, really strong asylum cases, but they did commit crimes. And we were able to win under relief under the Convention Against Torture. Um, right. Showing by a preponderance of evidence, that's 50% chance that if you return, you will be persecuted. Sure. Right. And, and there's also cases where, um, you know, some organizations um, such as the uh, BNP in Bangladesh, they have been yes. classified uh, by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, along with the U.S. Department of State as a tier three terrorist organization. Um, so that also in itself is not fatal to the claim, but there are legal arguments that must be made to um, to clarify to the court that our, our client's actions or membership should not fall under that bar um, to asylum. Yes, it's, you know, it's very common actually. Part of persecution, many countries, is that they will arrest you you know, uh, and charge you with a frivolous crime. Um, so that needs to be explained to the court that no, they didn't really commit, you know, this is part of their persecution. Right, prosecution does not always, but sometimes it is persecution. Right? Yes, invidious prosecution in a legal term. Um, so we do have experience with, like you were um, speaking earlier about the BNP in Bangladesh, um, right. they have been at certain times classified as a tier three terrorist organization. And um, we have, you know, many clients um, that are BNP members, and we're well adapted to discussing this, arguing in court, um, and going from there. Yes, so uh, we, we have some questions. Um, how will the asylum officer make a decision about whether to grant asylum? So I think I went over this very briefly um, earlier. Um, there, the asylum officer will go through all of the elements that are required for um, a grant, which is you have to prove that you are a, uh, a member of the group that you claim to be a part of, whether it's a political um, political organization or um, or a race and nationality, if you're part of um, a, a, a race of people that are a minority in your home country, um, you, you have to go through that. For example, if you're um, claiming that you are a Roma, um, you'll have to testify about what it is that makes uh, a person Roma and why you identify as a Roma person. Um, and then once you identify, uh, you know, testify at, about your membership to that group, you're going to testify about, the, the officer will ask you questions about uh, any harm that you've suffered in the past. Then they will ask you any about any harms that you are afraid that you will suffer if you were to go back to your home country. Um, and they then they'll go over any bars such as a one-year filing deadline bar, or if you've been convicted or arrested for any crimes, they will ask you about that. And then they will make the decision um, about whether to grant, deny, or refer your claim to immigration court. Typically, um, the asylum office will have you come back in two weeks to pick up the decision. Sometimes they mail the decision to the applicant um, through the mail. Okay. Um, so how can, can my asylum status be terminated? Yes, it can. Um, and that has happened. We have seen that happen in cases where, um, where, you know, after the grant of asylum, there's maybe facts revealed where maybe that um, applicant is associated with others who 
conducted questionable um, acts, even though that doesn't mean the applicant themselves presented any false claims or um, were untruthful, but maybe they were associated. Maybe they, that person um, helped them fill out the application or help them submit their application. Um, then the office, the government might go back to all of the applications that were prepared by that person um, that's associated with the wrongdoing and try to terminate the status. In that case, the asylum office will give you the opportunity to come back uh, and do uh, an interview to explain why your your status should not be terminated. And if it was granted by the asylum uh, by the immigration court, you will have an opportunity to go back to the immigration judge to explain why your status should not be um, terminated. Okay. Uh, another reason is unfortunately, if you go back to your country of origin after you're granted, um, that would, you, when you're filing asylum, when you're claiming you're a, an asylee, you're saying, I cannot go back because I will be persecuted. If you go back, you've proven, you could possibly prove it's safe for you to return and they could terminate your status. Right, yes. Um, and a lot of times this comes up also uh, down the road when maybe they were granted their asylum, uh, they, were, they even received their green card. So one year after you, uh, you're granted asylum, you can apply for your legal permanent resident status, your green card. Um, so maybe they even got their green card and now they're at the US citizenship stage, which is five years after the grant of asylum. And um, the officer, um, the officer, I'm, I apologize for any noise in the background. Um, and the officer might be going through your file and may maybe pick up on some inconsistencies between your original asylum application and then your green card application and now your citizenship application. So that might raise some flags to the officer and which might end you in removal proceedings where you have to um, defend yourself there. Yes. Um, also, th there are some exceptions to this, such as changed circumstances. Say you were um, politically, pers you are persecuted for your political opinion and the, you were granted asylum and then that political party um, just, you know, was thrown out of government and the leader, the leaders um, arrested. Well, it's now safe for you to return if they're not, no longer in power. Um, but you may have to argue this, you know, it's still an issue. Um, we see changed circumstances in a lot of our cases, especially because this, the process takes so long. So it's, uh, it's a double-edged sword, sword. Sometimes you, you will, you'll have a very strong asylum case and then you're, the political party or the religious militia or whoever you fear are eradicated and out of power. The court will then say, now it's safe for you to go back. Now there's a couple decisions that, we, that can be used to help you and the court can at their discretion grant you, still grant you asylum if you prove that you did suffer as persecution. Um, but there's also, you know, we have a couple cases where there's changed circumstances um, in future persecution. Um, we have a current case, can't talk about it too much, but respondent said something in public, came to the United States, and while he was here, the law changed and made what he said illegal. It's a, um, it's what he said was now illegal, and they had a warrant out for his arrest. So this is clearly a, polit a, a political opinion that he said in public. It was legal while he was there. While he came to the United States, the law changed, and they will arrest him if he returns. It's a changed circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, um, you know, just I'm just grabbing a ex random example here. The U.S. government can also change their. Um, 
the way that they view certain groups. Um, at one point, it could be, you know, for example, if you um, helped. Um, uh, that's exactly the case I was thinking about. Yes, yes if in the 80s sir. you helped uh, Afghanistan fight against the USSR, and you maybe you were granted asylum on that basis. Um, but now the US government might have a different opinion on those people who fought against the USSR. Um, so there's yes, yeah. a very interesting case we have. Yeah. yeah. So there's uh, many nuances. Um, um, that could, um, you know, to, that we could discuss uh, with asylum claims here. Yes. So, we're ready for more questions. Yeah, okay. great. The video questions? How is this? How are oh, we yes. We're ready for any video questions. I see a Mr. K. Yes. Hello. Hello, Mr. Mr. K. Uh, hi. 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 Uh, myself, Mr. K. I have one question. What will be the benefits of receiving asylum? Okay, so Greg, you wanna uh, the, the get benefits of receiving asylum? What is the what will be the benefits of receiving asylum? So Receiving asylum, once you receive asylum, you're granted what's called asylee status, which gives you access to government benefits. And a year after you're granted asylum, you can then apply for legal permanent residency. Um, the biggest benefit is you can stay in the United States legally and eventually get your citizenship. Um, you can continue to work here. Also, another huge benefit is that once you are granted asylee status, and even before you are granted legal permanent residency, you're allowed to bring in your, to the United States, your immediate, some immediate family members, such as your wife or children. Does right. that your spouse yeah. or your children, yes. Spouse or, or younger children, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. Yeah. Yes. So um, we're more than, I um, love these video questions, but please keep in mind, um, this is not considered privileged because it's um, uh, broadcast. So I would, um, please feel free to ask whatever you want but I would not share too many um, confidential details that you wouldn't like being brought up later. Okay, see Mr. Ash. Yes, hello. Hi. 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 Yes, Hi. I have a question. I received asylum. So can I apply for a green card or a citizenship? You were issued asylum? You won your, your case? Yes, yes, I received asylum. So can I apply okay. for a green card? Well, first of all, congratulations. Okay, we're happy to have you here. Okay, you can, you like I said, right now you have what's called asylee status. So do you have uh, family members? Is your wife with you here? Uh, nobody is here actually, I'm just no. coming. Are, are you married? Do you have a wife yes. country of origin? Well, right now you can petition to have her come here. Okay, and be with you. And you can apply for legal permanent residency, a green card, in one year after your, the date of your grant. And then five years from then, you can apply to be a citizen. Oh, that's good. Okay. okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Gregory. Thank, Thank you, Mr. So Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you. And congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Any other ones? Um, I think if we if we don't have any more questions, we can start um, wrapping up the webinar. Sure.
me just check in. Okay, we do have a few more questions. Okay. Um, do I need to bring in an interpreter to the asylum office and to immigration court? So, um, office at the asylum office is that you have your your own interpreter interpreting for you, and there will also be um, a monitor. Uh, a telephonic monitor um, during the interview to just ensuring that your interpreter is interpreting correctly and of course is not providing you with any legal advice, um, um, you know, in, in the process of the case and make sure, you know, they're not adding to or taking away from what it is that you're um, testifying to during the interview. Um, Ray, you can talk about, um, what happened in immigration court? In what? In immigration court with the interpreter. Does okay. the does the applicant? Mm -hmm. I, so the court, it's the attorney's job to tell the, inform the court that an interpreter will be needed. Now we we have many clients that have been here for a long time and speak English very well. I, unless you're a native-born speaker, I strongly recommend getting an interpreter, even if you speak English fluently. I suggest getting an interpreter because it slows everything down. When you're in court, you're going to have, you're sitting there on the stand and I'm going to be yelling at you. The prosecutor is going to be yelling at you and the judge is going to be yelling at you. And it's very um, disconcerting and difficult. Okay. So an interpreter allows you to listen to what is being said in English, assuming you know some English. Then they translate it to you, and then you speak, right? It, it slows everything down. Um, generally, I have a lot of clients that they don't want interpreters because they say, I speak English so well. Please keep, keep an interpreter. It, it, it helps so much articulating um, what your case, what you mean, um, and what you're trying to say. Um, and, like, and then for, for me as an attorney, the best part is that it just slows everything down. So you have more time to think, more time to act, and go from there. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And in those kind of situations, uh, where you know you're before a government official, most people get a little nervous, and yes. um, they tend to start kind of you know just spilling everything without. Um, thinking and and like you mentioned, Greg, it really helps slow down the process so that our clients, so that the applicant can think about their answer, think about the question being asked before they answer. Yes, and their answer will be you know articulated and stated correct correctly and accurately. Um, right, and, and you know it's where a lot of legal terms come up, which you know even if you are you know, speak English well, um, maybe in this setting, um, you know, where, you know, bigger words might be used, it might, you know, the interpreter will definitely be helpful. Yeah, okay. you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to, if, if you can, we, we had a recent case actually, where there was translate, they, our clients got uh, their document, their statements translated by a, um, not by a professional, we'll just leave it at that. And it didn't articulate their um, political reasoning, their, their fear of political persecution. It didn't state it correctly. They just left it out. And by and this came up during trial. Why didn't you say this? You're saying this now, but originally you, you said something else. And our, we had to work very quickly to properly translate these original documents and prove to the court that they're testimony remain consistent throughout their case. Yes. So we have another question. Um, what if I did not apply for asylum within one year of arriving in the United States? Um, so um, it's not fatal. It's definitely makes it harder um, to get asylum um, if you apply after one year, but it's not impossible because there are exceptions to the one-year filing deadline um, 
And those exceptions are if there are um, extraordinary circumstances um, or change circumstances. So what are those two things? Extraordinary circumstances means that um, there might be a legal reason you did not apply. For example, if you're underage, um, if you were in the country, if you came to the country when you were very young um, and uh, you, uh, you when, when you became older, maybe um, you became, you're, you're a member of the LGBTQ community. Maybe you transitioned um, and then you apply for asylum when you're 19, 20, 21. So obviously you're filing your asylum application uh, long after one year after you've arrived in the United States. So in that case, you do have um, a legal reason why you didn't apply because you were underage. Um, and you you might also fit into, um, you know, a changed circumstance uh, before you weren't maybe openly LGBTQ uh, part of the community, or maybe you had not transitioned, maybe you had not received a specific surgery. Um, um, so, so there are exceptions to that rule. Um, Greg, do you want to talk about any exceptions that you've seen in your experience? Yes, and there's two that come to my mind. One is unfortunately very common, and um, that and it's called the Lazada claim for ineffective counsel. And many times immigrants come here, and they, you know, if you're anyone who's been in the country. It, it takes a little while to figure out, you know, what's going on. You don't know the language, and they'll go to um, unscrupulous attorneys or notarios, and they won't properly file their claim. So, uh, so what we do, we have to argue, is that their previous counsel did not effectively file their claim within time, and that they had intended for it to be filed within one year. But for the uh, now practice, if you will, or the fail, the negligence of the prior counsel to file this within one year, it would have been filed. Um, so that's something that we see, unfortunately, we see and we have to deal with. Um, another one, which we had, which our firm had to fight for, and it's uh, lesser known, is um, uh, interfamily issues such as divorce. We had a case where um, a woman was told by her husband that he had filed the asylum and he did not. And they left, they got a divorce and she then realized her case was not filed within one year. Um, and that was something that we had to fight for. And we eventually, um, it, it succeeded, that issue, the case succeeded. Yeah. So. Um, it, it is um, problematic and it does make the case more difficult, but um, it is not fatal. We, we have had clients um, who filed after one year and they were granted asylum. So um, I would I would suggest um, those people in 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 that um, in those circumstances you know, speak to an experienced attorney right away to see if um, they it's you know they can still file their claim. So I, I see another question that I find is more common than most people think, and that is, can I cancel my asylum case? And the answer is yes, you can always withdraw your asylum case. Um, there are consequences, depends on the case. Um, it, because these cases take so long, people you know, find spouses, they fall in love, they get married. And they're able to adjust their status through their U.S. citizen spouse. Um, it doesn't mean your case was, was frivolous or it wasn't strong. It's just always a risk going to court. And I recommend to all my clients that if there's a safer way for you to, you know, the, the end goal is the green card. And if there's a safer way, we will withdraw your we will help you withdraw the claim and adjust your status through other means. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's something we see very commonly as well. Um, 
you know, yeah, these cases, like we mentioned earlier, can take up to 10 years. And, uh, you know, our clients meet people, they get married, sometimes their kids turn 21. And, uh, you know, if you have a child able to file for you, um, a US citizen child that's able to file for you, um, and you're inspected, like Greg said, the end goal is to uh, live safely in the United States. And if you can get that through, um, you know, um, through a family um, based petition, which is relatively easier because there's less things you have to prove to the US government um, to get your green card that way, we, we definitely encourage that. I mean, it's some, I mean, we have several cases, they are extremely strong asylum cases. I, I would, extremely strong, but, you know, there's, there's an easier way. So it doesn't mean your case isn't strong or it was frivolous, it just means that things change in your life and um, go from there. Exactly. You have to work smart. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Any other questions? I think that's it. I think we've uh, addressed all our questions. So um, again, feel free to reach out to myself, uh, Soraya Rahman, or Attorney Gregory Ippolito. We're both experienced attorneys in asylum and other immigration matters. Um, We have three offices. Um, uh, They're listed on, uh, you know, the panel on the side. We have our Jackson Heights, New York office, uh, in Jamaica, Queens, and Ozone Park, also in Queens. The numbers are on the side. Uh, Ozone Park is 718-577-0711. Jamaica, 718-764-6911. And uh, Jackson Heights is 718-263-5999. You can also email us directly um, if you prefer. Uh, uh, Greg's email is Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y at gehilaw.com, G-E-H-I-L-A-W.com. Mine is Soraya at gehilaw.com. That's S-U-R-Y-I-A at gehilaw.com. Please feel free to reach out to us with your questions and we will um, try to help you the best we can. Okay. Thanks all for joining. And thank you, Greg, for joining the panel. Thank you, Soraya, for having me. Thank you. Bye.